can't eat and swallow at the same time. Check. Praise God. We want to welcome you all tonight. Thank God you came. We're going to worship Jesus. If you're tuning in tonight, thank God for you. Sing along with us. Invite the presence of God. Let's sing out that song, Oh God Most High. Oh God Most High, Almighty King, Champion of Heaven, Lord of everything. You won, you won, that has no sting. And standing in the victory, we sing. This evening, we're going to change it up a little bit. Let's sing out that song, Through Our God. Through Our God. Through Our God.
songs are hard. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, let's continue in an attitude of worship. Amen. Let's slow it down this evening. Let God have his way as we sing out that song every time that we are gathered. Every time that we are gathered together in his name, he is awesome in power and in strength. So let us continually offer a sacrifice to him, for it is Lisa for God's touch, uh, the assistant pastors, Jesse and Bethany Morales and Steve and Emily Cassio, all the area leaders for the mind and hand of God, our president, his cabinet, our military for God's protection. We're also praying for Pastor Rich Cox, the Redlands congregation, and for God's favor as well. Pastor Bob Torres, his wife Denise, and Brian and Janie St. Armand as they're assisting in Redlands. Uh, we're praying for Leonard Williams, the evangelist, his wife Patsy for God's touch. Uh, all of our fellowship churches throughout the earth, especially our sister churches, Andrew and Sabrina Sines in Riverside, Scott and Keisha Reed in Paris, George and Lisa Albron in Ontario, David and Lorraine Munoz in Highland, Juan and Debbie Landine in Montclair, and David and Chrissy Gatlip in Tyler, Texas. 
We're also praying for Renee and Molly Hernandez in Calexico for God's favor. Uh, the International Works, Felipe and Daisy Segovia in Bogota, Colombia, and also Sebastian and Bibiana Lopez in Cali, Colombia. Also Mario and Christy Mejia in Lima, Peru for God's favor. I want to believe God for our church here, the Covina Congregation, new converts for blessings, uh, job favor, pay raises, promotions. Uh, we're also praying for the Chacon family for continued uh, salvation, Dora for healing, Mary Irvin for God's touch and healing in her life, uh, the Echeverria family for God's hand, uh, Rob Harris, Kainoa, and Sally Harris all for healing. Uh, Jackson, uh, my co-worker's nephew, for healing. Pastor Zazueta, Maria Henderson, and Gwendolyn, all for healing. Pete Lopez for recovery from a knee surgery. Gathia and Jose, both for salvation. Uh, Jerry for healing. Um, uh, Ruby's family for God's touch. Uh, um, her, her children and the loss that, of our sister Ruby, who is one into eternity, is with Jesus now. Uh, but pray for her children uh, for comfort and strength. I want to pray for the Rios family for comfort as well. And uh, Eddie Rios uh, uh, had, has uh, uh, passed away in the evening overnight. Uh, they found him in his bed, um, you know, not, not breathing. So he has passed on. So pray for comfort for Steve and uh, Monica and the Rios family. Also believing God for Pastor, I think it's Pastor Lee. Yeah, oh, that's Pastor Lee. That's... Uh, Kathy, our sister that visits once in a while. It's her pastor at her other church. Uh, so pray for him. Maria Haregi for healing upon her body. Uh, Maria from the Orange Congregation for healing from COVID. And also um, God's favor upon our fellowship. Amen. That God would overshadow us, protect us all uh, from, vi from the virus and believe God for great things. Uh, I also want to pray for the Ontario Congregation. For the Contreras family, uh, this is a, a brother in the church who passed away from COVID. Also, I believe there was another sister not too long ago, not, not even a week ago probably, that has passed away from COVID as well. And also Robert Nieto, uh, who was on a ventilator as well, he has passed on uh, uh, into eternity, all from COVID. So let's believe God for great things in our lives, the protection of God, health and wholeness. Uh, and so we'll go before the Lord in prayer, and then when we subside, I'll go ahead and open us in prayer this evening. Let's pray and believe God. Heavenly Father, we love you this evening, Lord God. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives, God. We come with an expectancy, Lord God. We're asking, God, that you would heal all those that are on this prayer request, Lord God, all the names that were brought to before you this evening. God, we come. God, we know that you are capable of all things, Lord God. Let your will and your purpose be established tonight, Lord God. Bring conviction upon the preaching of your word. Let us leave here changed and transformed, God. Feel the new with the Holy Ghost, Lord God. God, we give you glory and we give you praise tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet one another this evening. I believe God for each other this evening. Amen. God, thank you guys for coming out this evening. You're tuning in tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Praise God. We do uh, 
want to give you a few announcements, let you know about all that God is doing in our services. We are having services in the building currently back every service. Um, so I encourage you to come out, be a part of that if you can. If you're still not comfortable with that, uh, you're more than welcome to continue tuning in. We will um, record these and put the, the link out for you. It may not be till the following day because we have to upload it and we have to do all the different things. So uh, be patient with that. So after we uh, you know, have our service, we will upload that to YouTube. It takes some time for that to take place. Uh, uh, and usually it's not till the next day. But we will send that link out uh, on our, in our uh, chat, our Covina chat uh, on WhatsApp, and then we'll also send it out to the individuals that you've been already getting them. You will continue to get those. Uh, uh, you'll just have to wait a little bit. Praise God. Um, we are going to have our services every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you want to come out and join us, uh, uh, there's plenty of room. We are doing you know our services according to the CDC guidelines. That's uh, whether it's 20% uh, uh, non-essential uh, limit in the building or 30% uh, in essential businesses um, inside the building. Uh, we, we meet that in both of those areas. So come out, uh, be involved in what God is doing. Uh, let God speak to you. That's every Sunday morning. Actually, this uh, uh, Sunday morning, uh, we, we are going to start Bible study again at 10 a.m., and our morning service at 11 a.m., and we also are having our evening service um uh, Sunday evening at 7 p.m. and also midweek service Wednesday night 7 30 so be involved let God help you uh, we need God in our lives especially during what's going on people are stressing out over their jobs people are stressing out uh, over having their kids in the house more than they normally do uh, uh, so it's causing stress on parents it's causing stress in the home <laughs> So let God help us. We need the preaching of God's word. It brings comfort. It brings peace. It does what nobody else can do. God is faithful. And if you would put him in your life, your life would go much, much easier. So believe God for that. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we are having Bible conference in Prescott, Arizona. If you're interested in going to that, I encourage you to try to get to those conferences. Uh, it'll blow your mind. It'll open up your eyes to a, to a greater understanding of what our fellowship is all about uh, and that is uh, january 11th through the 15th monday through uh thursday uh, so be a part of that if you're interested you can see me um, about going to that uh, i'll give you hotel information and different stuff uh, um, so see me if you are interested in going they do have some guidelines for that uh, if you are have children you know they do have children's church guidelines uh, uh, the nursery is they're only taking infants up to 12 months old uh, there will be a nursing room available for mothers who are breastfeeding uh, uh, children's church will not be provided this conference so don't bring your children uh, uh, and expect them to go into children's church because they are not having it because of the CDC guidelines uh, the infection rate and all the different things that go along with that uh, um, and they also ask if you've been knowingly exposed to COVID during that time or confirmed with COVID during that time within the last 10 days or Monday night of conference, please do not attend this conference, uh, even if you're not showing symptoms. So um, I will, you know, uh, we'll try to post this up, uh, um, you know, on our church chat. We'll take a picture. We'll send this out. Take a look at that if you plan on trying to go to conference uh, so you're not... Uh, um, you, you're not exposed to any, <laughs> you know, unknown, uh, they don't let you come in. So I uh, driving all the way to Prescott and then you are breaking one of the guidelines and they don't let you in conference. So, uh, we will post that for you. Praise God. That is all the announcements. We're going to take an offering this evening, give you a chance to invest in all that God is doing. Uh, again, we're not passing the normal plate around because of the, you know, uh, code, uh, CDC guidelines with the, you know, uh, sharing the plate and exposing anybody to unnecessary uh, risks. Um, but we are going to take an offering and give you a chance to invest in all that God is doing. We have our tithe box over there on the table to my right, to, to your left, and you are filled, you know, you are more than welcome to drop your offering, your tithe, your pledges, whatever it is that you want to give to God into that. Uh, 
uh, into that box. Maybe there's others you're tuning in tonight. You, you're not coming to church right now. We still have our mailbox drop-off uh, where you can drive by and drop that, slip that into the mailbox uh, at our church. There's two slots. Either one of the doors has one. Uh, you can put it in either door and, uh, you know, believe God. But the Bible does say that the tithe belongs to God. It is his. The word tithe is, simply means 10%. And that is off the top. That's supposed to honor God first with our finances. That way, uh, after you spent all your money, you paid all your bills, there's nothing left over. Uh, that's why God wants it off the top. Let's do that. Let's be faithful to that, to honor God, uh, put him first. God will do amazing things in your life that you will uh, not understand it all. And I still don't understand it to this day that God releases into my life at the you know critical times. He's done it over and over and over again. And I know it's linked to, to, to the faithfulness of our giving. Can I tell you, we can't just come once in a great while. Every time we have a need, okay, God, here, here's a couple bucks. No, it's faithfulness uh, over, you know, uh, consistently over every increase that we get. The Bible says the increase. That's something that you uh, don't, you didn't have before. Then it all of a sudden comes into your life. That is an increase. That's your paydays. That, you know, uh, the different things that you have, uh, uh, you know, and maybe, you're, you know, you're playing the lottery. You know, as a Christian, you probably shouldn't be. But, you know, you win the lottery. Yeah, honor God. <laughs> Put him first. Uh, Believe God for great things. Uh, God takes care of his church. Let's take care of his kingdom. Amen. Let's give God praise as the usher comes tonight. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. God, we ask your blessing, your anointing. Uh, God, that you would move outside the natural into the supernatural. Amen. Again, I'm sorry I said the usher come. But we're not taking the offering. But as we sing out this song, uh, I will sing unto the Lord a new song. Let, feel free to drop that off uh, in the box. Amen. Praise God. I will sing to the Lord a new song. your Bibles this evening, John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verse 1 through 13 this evening, I want to preach a sermon about God's perfect timing. Because whether you believe it or not, God has the perfect timing in your life. Whatever it is that's going to happen in your life, uh, as Christians, when we wait on God, uh, God will bring it uh, at the right time. And I want to preach about that this evening because too many times in life, uh, we rush things along because we feel God is taking too long. I can't tell you all the times that I have seen people make a mess of their lives uh, because they are impatient uh, and they don't like to wait on God. You might feel God has shown you things uh, uh, in visions or dreams, you might have uh, been re that you might even have received words uh, from evangelists during revivals uh, of how God is going to move in your life. Uh, he has shown you the end uh, from the, the, the beginning from the end, uh, and it's a glorious picture of what you think God has for you uh, and in the kingdom of God. But the only thing is, God doesn't exactly show you when. I've seen people mess up their lives in marriages, marrying unsaved people because they don't wait on God to bring the right person uh, into the church. Men and women both, I've seen this happen time and time again. Uh, or maybe it's even taken them right out of the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, but, but can I tell you, God has the perfect timing. And it's my opinion that the number one thing that, you know, uh, sidetracks people or derails people's faith uh, in the dream or the promises that God has given them is the time that they have to wait. Right now, our church, uh, uh, you know, is just coming back from a, you know, basically after several months uh, of not having in-house, you know, in-house uh, services. Uh, 
Uh, but can I tell you, uh, God knows what he's doing. He knows what the right time is for our church. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, we might come to church and think, what is God doing in our church? But can I tell you, uh, we are in the planting stages. The problem is now we just have to have the patience to wait uh, to see what God has for our church. We've been sowing through the years. We've been here going on eight years now. And, you know, uh, we've seen pe God bring people in, people leave. Uh, we've seen people get saved. We've been seen people, you know, go out of their minds. Can I tell you, uh, we might not understand it, but we need to understand that God knows what he's doing. And he has the right timing for our church. The kingdom of God is like that seed that is being planted and a good farmer knows that he can't uh, plant one day and expect the harvest the next day uh, because crops, uh, uh, just like our lives, are not microwavable. We can't just place our life in the microwave, uh, uh, hit, you know, uh, 30 seconds, uh, and then boom, pop out. There's your glorious family. There's your children, right? <laughs> There's your retirement. It doesn't work like that. We're not, you know, our lives are not microwavable. Uh, uh, and neither are God's promises. Uh, and spiritually speaking tonight, uh, uh, planted seed represents the time of waiting. And this waiting time is meant to produce uh, the disciplines of trust and faith in God. How many people here love it when God makes you wait for something? Yeah, that's what I thought. No hands. <laughs> And I would say, don't raise your hands because then I would have to say, uh, uh, you're not telling the truth. Nobody likes to wait. Nobody likes waiting. One of the best examples from the Bible about someone rushing things along, uh, you know, uh, because they didn't want to wait on God's perfect timing was Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was 85 years old. He's in prayer one day when God tells him that he will be the father of many nations. Abraham says, that's impossible, God. I have no children and especially no son to carry on my name. Not only that, uh, but Sarah and I have been collecting Social Security. In other words, uh, you know, 85 years old, if you go by the you know, average 65 years of, of retirement age, uh, here they are 20 years into their retirement. Uh, and at that age, they're not expecting any children. But God assures him, you will have a son, Abraham. You will have a son. Abraham believes God and he builds, uh, you know, uh, he begins to prepare for that. Uh, you know, like we would if we were going to have kids. You know, we begin to uh, uh, prepare a room. We begin to buy the crib. We begin to add a nursery, you know, uh, a room onto his tent. Uh, here's Abraham. And he waits. He waits one year two years, three years, uh, and his wife, Sarah, begins to get impatient from the waiting. So she, she, uh, so she suggests uh, that they help God out uh, by using her maidservant, Hagar, uh, as the surrogate mom. So Abraham goes into her uh, uh, and follows his wife's advice, uh, and Ishmael is born, uh, and Ishmael is the product of two humans uh, trying to help God out uh, with his promise uh, uh, and, and is therefore considered to be the son of the flesh. In other words, their, their idea, their idea that wasn't a spiritual idea, it was a fleshly idea, all because of their impatience. Ishmael's uh, presence brings chaos uh, on the home and Sarah begins to resent him Hagar thinks she's now the first wife because she has bore him children and now Abraham is caught in the middle wondering why he ever listened to his wife instead of God finally 14 years after the initial promise when Abraham is now 99 years old God tells him he will be a father this time next year with his you know, his wife, Sarah, this time God's way. The next year, Isaac is born, the son of the promise that God originally had spoken, the blessing and gift of God that came in our father's timing, 
right? Not through any effort of uh, on the part of Abraham or Sarah. And it's critically important for all of us to learn tonight uh, the discipline of waiting. Too many of us are settling for the pain and chaos uh, of our impatience uh, uh, that our Ishmaels will bring because we're not willing to wait for God. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the Isaacs that God has for us, uh, uh, you know, we just don't, we don't like waiting for that. And Jesus shows us how to do, uh, how to be patient here in our chapter uh, uh, of chapter, uh, John chapter 7. Now, I want to preach about uh, God's perfect timing. John chapter 7, starting in verse 1, reading through verse 13. It says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one, no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it uh, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast, uh, or you go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, they, um, then uh, he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast uh, and said, where is he? And, where, or, and, there is, uh, and there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, no, to the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So listen in our scripture, you see, uh, Jesus waited on God's timing. What I want to look at this evening is how we can do the same and avoid having more Ishmael's uh, being born in life uh, uh, that robs our blessing of our future that God had prepared for us. Jesus shows us the way. They, his brothers, if you are the Messiah, then he, they begin to question him. Why are you messing around here in the sticks where no one can see you? Go to Judea, the big city, and show yourself for who you are. See, Jesus didn't do that, and he answered them in our scripture in John 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. It wasn't the right time. It wasn't the perfect timing. And Jesus knew that uh, because Jesus had a laser focus uh, on God's will, on his father's will, uh, on his father's timing, uh, on his father's methods. And nothing was going to sway him uh, from moving away, uh, not even one inch from God's plan. How did Jesus do that? How did Jesus resist the urge uh, to speed things along uh, or ride a wave of the popularity uh, uh, that he could have got from healing uh, in public straight in, uh, uh, you know, into the to the rise of popularity? How did he do that? How did he know to wait on God's will? He knew his calling. That's what we want to look at firstly. Because Jesus knew his place in the kingdom. He knew what his calling was all about. And Jesus filtered through everything, right, through that calling, through that mission, knowing and discovering. Can I tell you tonight, you need to know your calling and you need to discover your purpose in life. Because that is critical for the fullness of God's blessing upon your life. Seeking God is not just about praying or reading your Bible or doing good works, which we should be doing. Seeking God is about knowing his mind, knowing his heart, and knowing his plan for you. For you. And then you responding in obedience to that calling. Have you discovered your calling? Everyone has the call of God on their lives. 
We have made the mistake in the modern church age of equating the call of God with ministry in the church. People think that they have to be uh, on the platform, uh, playing the keyboard, uh, playing the guitar, uh, playing the drums uh, to understand what their calling is. But that is just helping out in the church. Yes, I know it's ministering, uh, but can I tell you, it's beyond that. It's beyond that. We don't have to be involved in that to, be, to find your calling in the things of God. They think they have to have the platform ministry, and that's the only way. But can I tell you, that is not uh, all the way right. Uh, any one of us can minister to someone uh, without being involved in ministry. Any one of us can invite someone to church. Any one of us can call someone up on the phone and ask them how they're doing. Any one of us can invite someone out to lunch, uh, or any one of us can have someone over our house for fellowship. If I can do anything for you today, I want you to understand the incredible plan of God for your life. And it has nothing to do with who stands behind this pulpit or on this platform tonight. That's how Jesus understood his calling. He didn't rush to the city and do all his miracles in front of everybody like he was having a platform ministry. Jesus did what he did wherever he went. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, compared to what Jesus' brother were saying, right? I'll come and show your miracles over here. You want to be known openly, so come and show your miracles so people will see them. That's what his brothers were saying. And Jesus' response uh, makes much more sense. Uh, their ideas didn't fit within Jesus' calling. Uh, and therefore, he reject Jesus rejected that. That's one of the secrets of spiritual success uh, is knowing what is uh, uh, from God and what isn't from God. And then shaping your whole life uh, around that instead of simply existing in life. Another way Jesus succeeded in God's will and plan for his life uh, is that he understood the timing, right? He knew his calling and he understood the timing. Years ago, John Maxwell, he was the, you know, all the rage in church leadership. His books were required uh, reading uh, in most Bible colleges. Uh, and within one of his books, The 21 Essential Laws of Leadership, uh, John Maxwell taught uh, was the law of timing. Within the law of timing, he gave four truths. Number one, he says, wrong action at the wrong time equals disaster. Number two, he says, the right action at the wrong time equals massive resistance and rebellion. Number three, he says, the wrong action at the right time equals mistake and failure. And the number four thing he says, the right action at the right time equals success and massive growth. In other words, fruitfulness. Because when the timing's right, uh, and when you're doing the right thing at the right time, you are gonna experience success and growth. So let's apply that to what Jesus' brothers were suggesting. We know from reading the scripture that Jesus' brothers uh, didn't believe in what Jesus' uh, mission was. Uh, but for the sake of argument, let's assume they were sincere in their advice. Let's look at a few hypothetical situations. The wrong action at the wrong time with Jesus. So let's say Jesus goes to Jerusalem two years early. In the fall, instead of the spring... Uh, and that would bring disaster. Pilate was the new governor and was in initially very heavy handed in his administration of Roman rule and most likely would have had Jesus and anyone who followed him immediately crucified. The whole plan of salvation, much less most uh, of the gospels uh, of the New Testament would never have been written. And we would still be dead in our sins uh, because numerous prophetic scriptures uh, would remain unfulfilled. 
Let's look at right action at the wrong time. According to Jesus' brothers. Let's say Jesus shows himself uh, uh, the following spring or the, you know, uh, the following spring during the Passover. Uh, the same result would have happened. And his fame had not yet reached the point uh, where we uh, uh, where would uh, where would he have been uh, in public? Uh, he had reached the point where he had would have been in any public support, uh, and he would have met huge resistance uh, among the people. Now let's look at wrong action at the right time. Let's say Jesus. Uh, in his third year of ministry, right before the Passover, uh, assembles every follower he has in Galilee, uh, and he shows up in Jerusalem, surrounded by hundreds of people, uh, demanding that he be made king of the Jews. That would have resulted in civil war, right? The Herodians versus the, the Pharisees uh, versus the Sadducees. Uh, it would have been a civil war and eventually Rome would have destroyed Jerusalem. However, the plan of salvation stayed intact because Jesus understood his calling. He understood the correct timing and therefore came as the Old Testament prophesied that he would. How many know the New Testament has to bear fruit of what the Old Testament spoke about? And that's exactly where Jesus came in the picture. He knew about the timing of God and he understood the correct timing and he became king at the right moment. The right action at the right time which resulted in massive success. His death and resurrection are reason for you and I, uh, are the reason that you and I are here in this building tonight. Because Jesus knew all about waiting for God's timing. The Bible says we have a high priest who sympathizes with our suffering because he went through every temptation yet without sin. His earthly ministry began and ended with an attack by Satan himself, but Jesus overcame the obstacles while waiting on God. During the wilderness temptation, you know, before Jesus went into his earthly ministry, he went in, he was tempted by the devil, you know, by Satan. Satan comes, tries to trip up Jesus by tempting him in three ways. And they are the same three ways the devil tempts us today. The same ways that Jesus, that, that Satan tempts us. That will circumvent God's sovereign and complete blessing for you. Let me give you the background of the first temptation. Remember Jesus is fasting. 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, on day one, I'm starving. <laughs> day two, you know, I'm beyond starving. And usually I, once I make it past day two, I can actually make it through day three. But can you imagine 40 days? You're going to be a little hungry, right? Uh, your kids are going to start looking like chicken, right? Uh, they're going to start looking like pizza. You know, everything you look at is going to look like some type of food. So Jesus is hungry. He's a bit hungry. Uh, and that's what the devil firstly comes out of him. And he says, turn these stones to bread. Turn these stones to bread. In other words, use your power for yourself, for your own flesh. And I want all of us to understand something this tonight, uh, right now about life. It really doesn't even matter if you are a Christian or not. Uh, this truth still applies to everyone. How many know it's not about us? It's not about you. It's not about me. Uh, uh, it's not even about this church. Uh, what I want you to understand, the meaning of life here tonight uh, is God has given us all a calling, uh, has given us all a mission, uh, and he has empowered us with gifts uh, and talents to be used for that calling. Those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have the Holy Spirit within us to supercharge us, uh, to give us an ability uh, and, uh, you know, to give us giftings uh, that can be used uh, and they come from God. Your gifts, your talents come from God and therefore we're supposed to use them for his glory. It's not about us. 
It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the glory of God and his plan and not our own. And when we use them for ourselves to increase our fame and our, you know, popularity, we fall into the same trap that Satan was trying to set for Jesus. Satan was saying, Jesus, uh, you created everything. Uh, uh, some God you are. Uh, you're sweating right now. You're smelly. You're hungry uh, uh, in the desert. And all you have to do uh, is use your abilities for yourself. Speak the word, Jesus. The same word that caused the universe to spring into existence. Uh, but only this time, just feed yourself. Turn those rocks into bread and feed your flesh. You're starving. You're hungry. How many lives have been wrecked because people use their ability, their ability and their talents for themselves? I know lots of people who are not serving God today because they were doing everything to make themselves look good instead of to let God look good. One glance at the entertainment industry, industry shows us just that, right? People are sh they're, they're showing, they're boasting their own abilities, their own glamour. They're selling themselves out to, to be more and more popular. It's also one of the biggest infections of our nation today. To exist in fame or to be famous, uh, is it any wonder why one of the most popular entertainment shows that ever existed was called uh, American Idol, right? American Idol. Because people want to show themselves off. They want to make themselves look good. But can I tell you, we were created to make God look good. The second temptation Satan throws at Jesus uh, was to throw himself off the temple. Throw yourself off the top of the temple. In other words, show yourself to the people now. Let them see your glory. If we were to modernize Satan's temptation, uh, it would sound like this. Reveal yourself, Jesus. Show everybody how good you are how supernatural you are you don't have to take the slow road of three and a half years in ministry uh, uh, walking along the hot dusty highways preaching to the people healing people uh, doing my will I can book it for you right now uh, in Jerusalem uh, I can take you straight to Madison Square Garden in front of a big audience the biggest movers, the biggest shakers in the nation, let them see you take uh, a 10-story dive and be lowered to the ground, you know, hovering on the ground, you know, with angels, right? Then they will believe you. You don't need to wait. See, that's what the, day, the devil does to us. He tempts us. In our lives, the temptation to take the shortcut is huge. Give a little on the honesty, you know, uh, uh, on the job, you know, try to try to deceit and fraud people, you know, just to make a little extra money. Play the political game. Use gossip to your advantage, right? Uh, claim credit to yourself, not to your team. Take out your opponent. Uh, rise above the crowd. Uh, you know, these are the shortcuts of life. The need to be famous by taking a shortcut uh, uh, was seen in the 1994 U.S. Figure Skating Championship. Uh, if you uh, remember that back far back, or maybe if you were even born yet, uh, uh, when skater Tanya Harding uh, and her husband conspired to take out their biggest revival, their, their biggest revival, the rival, <laughs> Nancy Kerrigan, right? Remember? I don't know if you remember. I remember, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tanya Harding, uh, she, she's trying to take out her biggest competition so that she could win the Olympics by striking her behind the knee with a baton. Tanya Harding uh, ended up losing everything through trying to take a shortcut to, to Olympic gold and instead is looked at as an example uh, like now of allowing your ambition to take over and do the unthinkable to get ahead. They do anything. They'll cheat, they'll fraud, they'll do anything to make themselves win and look good. She was humiliated because people... They discovered everything about her. The third way Satan tempted Jesus in, modern, in the modern way of saying uh, is I'll give you what you want. 
the entire world if you'll worship me. That's what Satan was telling Jesus. Look at Jesus. He took him up on the table. He goes, look at all the kingdoms. I'll give it all to you. Just worship me, and it's all yours. Jesus, you don't have to do the cross thing. You don't have to die. You can have your kingdom now. I'll give it all to you right now. Could that be a temptation? You know, you know you're going to die, right? You know you're going to go to the cross and take the sins of the world. And all of a sudden, that's where Satan shows up and says, you know what, Jesus? Forget about that. I'll give you all of it now. I'll give it all, of, all of it to you right now. If you'll just worship me. You don't have to participate in the punishment for the humanity's sin. You can get everything you want, everything you desire if you do this one thing. Change the object of your worship. Instead of worshiping and doing your Father's will, just worship me and my ways instead. And all of this is yours. It's all yours. You see, the first two temptations of Jesus were really all about the third. Jesus using his power for himself would have been falling into self-worship, which really is Satan worship. And, you know, Jesus making himself famous uh, by performing a miracle in front of the entire Jewish uh, ruling class would have been falling into Satan's trap uh, of seeking fame for himself. Uh, and finally, Satan takes off the mask uh, of what he really wants to show, uh, uh, what he really wants Jesus, and that's what he wants Jesus' worship. Give it to me. Don't give it to your father anymore. Give it to me. Worship me. It's the same thing he wants from us today. He's trying to get us to follow him instead of following God. And can I tell you, it's the same trap. And we can over, overcome. The only way we can overcome is by following this principle found in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. And that is looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls now if we can do that church then we also share in Jesus's victory and as I'm closing tonight this is what I want to look at and end with because Jesus enjoyed a place in heaven with his father by doing his father's will. He didn't take the shortcuts. He didn't do it for himself. He came to do the will of his father. And he stayed to that pattern, that vision. And can I tell all of us here tonight, God has a plan for every one of us tonight. You need to discover, if you haven't figured out what that is, can I tell you, God's plan is the whole world to be saved. One soul at a time. Everything that we do in this church is geared at winning souls. Winning souls. And replicating what we do so we can put more churches out into new areas to disciple couples, to raise up people in the church, to go out into the world and continue to do what we're doing here. Winning souls, preaching the gospel, teaching others to do what we're doing. And that's how we can enjoy in Jesus' victory. You see, one of the biggest hindrances to modern spiritual growth uh, is that our attention spans, right? Uh, or And our tolerance for waiting is at an all-time low. Modern technology has made things so easy uh, that it has stripped the need uh, to persevere and to have patience through the tough times. Right? We have the microwave generation, the microwave mentality. Uh, we have Google. Uh, uh, we can find the answer at our fingertips. Uh, there's no need to wait. We don't have to research. Right? Why do I have a headache? I don't know. Let me Google it. <laughs> What is this rash all about? I don't know. Let me Google. You know, we're trying to we're trying to you know uh, heal ourselves uh, many times uh, instead of doing what's right and having patience uh, and working through things. It's a fact of human existence, uh, 
and it's a vital necessity uh, uh, to spiritual growth. Uh, if you want to live in victory, you will have to submit to God's timing for your life. You can't hurry it. You can't change the timetable. Uh, the only thing you can do, uh, uh, the only thing that will do is derail, uh, uh, derail your life uh, uh, and when you insist on your plan and your timing is better. When you think your timing is better. So maybe you're here tonight and you're interfering with God's timing. Remember, God has the perfect timing for your life. He knows what's best when the time is right and you have to learn to trust God. You have to get it in your mind. He really does know better than you. He really does know what he's doing. Too many times we think, God, I've been waiting. I've been doing it your way. I'm going to go ahead and take care of it this time. Don't do that. You'll make the biggest mistake of your life. And I've seen people over and over and over again have to go and start all over because they've tried to hurry up God's timing, God's plan. God has the perfect timing, church, and it's time for us to trust him with that timing. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord tonight. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed in reference to, to God and to those that are around you. God loves you. God cares for you. God does have a plan. He knows what he's doing. It's written right here. This is God's plan right here. We just need to read it, learn it, and live it. And then wait on God for him to bring the things to pass. The Bible says today is the day of salvation because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. You know, I'm hearing reports every day of people passing into eternity. Got a phone call last night. Just like that. Somebody that we know found their, their body dead in, in Oakland, California. Two people in the Ontario church within the last week passed into eternity because of COVID. The Redlands congregation just today another soul passed into eternity. Again on the Redlands chat this morning today Somebody was asking for prayer. The neighbor walked outside and collapsed in the driveway. Ambulance came, rushed him to the hospital in serious condition. And that's how critical life is. Life is but a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. We're not guaranteed another minute, another day, another hour. That's how serious life is. And can I tell you, God has a plan for our lives. And it is a plan that includes Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross, took the punishment of our sin upon his body so that we could find the will of God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. And that's one thing that we can know for certain is right today is the day of salvation. You don't have to wait on that one. That's God's timing is today is the day of salvation. That's where we all start in our walk with God. And the longer that you wait, the longer it is before you'll find the will of God. And if you're here this evening and you know that you're not right with God, there's sin living in your life right now. And you want to change that. You want to step into God's plan. You need to understand right now that it requires repentance. You have to admit that you're not right. And there's sin in your life. And you need to ask God to forgive you for that sin. 
And you need to invite him into your life. And if you're willing to do that tonight, Jesus can come into your heart and begin to show you great things. Tonight, you need Jesus. Would you lift your hand and say, you know what, that's me. If you're tuning in tonight, your heart's not right. You're living in sin. You're trying to do it on your own. Can I tell you, let Jesus have access to your life right now. You're tuning in right now. You need Jesus. Lift your hand all across this place. Unsaved are your backslid. Maybe you once knew the love of God, but you're back in sin. Maybe you were impatient and you tried to help God along and you made things worse in life. And now you are so far away from God. Your life's a mess. You're trying to pick up the pieces. Let Jesus come in and help you. Backslidden. Anybody here this evening, uh, your backslid, lift your hand and say, you know what, that's me, I need God. Are you tuning in? Your backslid, your hearts are not right. Lift your hand, respond this evening. Praise God. If you lifted your hand, these altars are open tonight. If you're tuning in, I want you to take a stand. Stand to your feet, take a step forward. And I want to lead you in a prayer. A prayer of repentance that you recognize, you know what, you need God to help you. You've messed things up. You need God to help you to fix it up, put the pieces back together. Take a, take a step forward right now. I want you to get to your knee right now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to say these words, Oh God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. Right now, I turn from my sin and open up my heart. And I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. From this day forward, I give you my life. Help me to serve you the rest of the days of my life. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. And you ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father. Give me strength to overcome my temptations and struggles and help me to do your will. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you said that prayer, I want you to pray. I want you to stay on your knee there and ask God to help you, to strengthen you, to give you a way of escape from every trial, every situation that comes against you and overwhelms you. Ask God to help you with that. The rest of us tonight in church, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship God. If you just need to get a hold of God, these altars are open. Let's worship God as we sing out that song every time that we are gathered. Every time that we are gathered together in his name, he is awesome in power.
Lord, grateful for all that you're doing. God, have right of way. God, give us patience to wait for you, God. For your timing is right and perfect, Lord God. Let us not rush things, God. God, let us not hinder your will and purpose by doing our own will. Hallelujah, Jesus. We glorify you tonight, God. Minister right now by the blood. God knows what's right, church. The right time, the right thing, when to do it. He knows all about that. We just need to be in our place uh, doing what God's called us to do. And can I tell you, you'll step right into God's plan. You'll step right into it. Be patient. Let God help you because he really does know what he's doing. Appreciate everybody coming tonight. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody, tonight. Uh, we miss you. Uh, uh, we're believing God for you. We're praying for you. Uh, pray for us. Uh, amen. Uh, and uh, you're always welcome to come to services where we're having indoor services. So come out and be a part of what God is doing. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord tonight. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Mark, would you ask God's blessing as we dismiss tonight? Father God, I thank you for your word, Father God, and the mercy and grace you've given us, Lord. Lord, I can help us, Lord, and to be patient, Lord, and let it be your time and not ours, Father God. Let us be still, Father God, and wait on you. Thank you, Father God, for protect us tonight as we go home and give us that safety in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless everyone.